A daytime Emmy-winning actress and soap opera star speaks out against the conviction of her retired NYPD husband and hero. After what happened to her own family, she has a warning about the weaponization of our federal government. Next. Martha Byrne, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate the time. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, too. The background here, at the age of 15, you became a soap opera star on As the World Turns. But, but sadly, this interview is about your actual life and how it's recently taken a turn uh, for the worse. Your husband, Michael McMahon, a former NYPD sergeant turned private investigator, highly decorated NYPD sergeant. He was basically convicted of being a spy, acting as an agent of China. How did this all happen? Well, my husband was a, again, highly decorated, 75 medals of honor on the NYPD. Yeah, he got the combat cross given to him for a shooting in the Bronx, a gang-related shooting. He was in a shootout in Times Square on New Year's Eve where he saved hundreds, if not thousands of lives. I mean, this is a man who was busy. He was a school safety sergeant in charge of 40 public and private schools in the Bronx. And then he was in a severe car chase accident. And the subject that ran him off the road had 19 prior arrests. He had beaten up his girlfriend so badly that she he had broken both of her eye sockets and he said he was going to kill a cop. And my husband chased him, you know, in the car and hit a telephone pole at 50 miles an hour, ending his NYPD career, which was devastating to him because he loved the job. He really did love it. He took the NYPD test when he was 16. Like he loved doing it. And then he became a private investigator after a couple of years and started working for some of the most respected defense attorneys in the tri-state area. And he got a phone call um, in fall of 2016, a routine case from a translation company in Queens, New York. They had a client who had money stolen from a business in China, and the man was allegedly laundering the money here in New Jersey. So they wanted a licensed New Jersey private investigator to do some background searches, you know, assets, LLCs, you know, does he own a lot of cars? Like, where is he, where is he spending this money? So my husband hired two of his former NYPD detectives to work with him on this case. He spoke to two federal agents about the case in 2016 and 17, and then never thought about it again. And three years later, the FBI is at my door before dawn saying that he failed to register as a foreign agent, FARA, and interstate stalking. And my husband notified the local police every time he was doing surveillance he did invoices, he did reports, surveillance reports. He saved everything to this day. He didn't delete anything. I mean, this is so insane. I mean, they came into my house, my poor children, you know, the trauma that they've instilled on my children is, is unforgivable. They never went to his home office. They never took his guns. They never took his computers. They didn't take his phone. They didn't take his notes. We handed in his guns the next day with the local police. This whole case is horrifying, and my husband committed no crime. I mean, everything he did, he was allowed to do as a licensed PI. So criminalizing the private investigative industry in this case is very scary because if his verdict sticks, parking on a public street can now be a federal crime. And I'm not joking about that. that that's how severe if this verdict stands, it will destroy the PI industry. It will destroy the news industry. It will destroy insurance companies who use private investigators. That's just the start of it, right? I think um, some people did follow it. They called it Operation Fox Hunt uh, in 2020. But, but you're right, this dates back, you know, four years earlier. Your husband then is charged for acting as an agent of a foreign government. He's charged with interstate stalking, conspiracy, uh, FARA, failure to register as a foreign agent. But is there any evidence of, of any of this? No, there's not one. None, there's not one email, text, invoice that has anything to do with the, a foreign government. So he was found not guilty on count one, conspiring with a foreign government to violate FARA. So what are we doing here? If he's not working for a foreign government and you can't prove it, it came out at court that he was recommended by an attorney that he had worked for, my husband, and the uh, the attorney that ended up recommending him again. The FBI never spoke to her until a few weeks before our trial. How, how they know it, right? They must know that it was from an American recommendation. So they couldn't pin it on him 
that he was connected to a foreign government. There's not nothing, no, no evidence of that. So the FBI is investigating Mike's client, un unbeknownst to, to Mike, he doesn't know, is his client was connected, uh, tied in with this criminal enterprise in, invo involving the, the Chinese Communist Party. But that's why I think people need to pay attention. Even without any evidence, your husband, Mike, is still charged. Correct. And what's interesting is that the client never asked him to do anything illegal. They hired N an NYPD retired sergeant. Do you really think they're going to tell him, hello, I'm a Chinese agent. Here's my card. We're going to make you be a part of our harassment ca campaign for a few thousand dollars. I mean, the, the whole thing is ridiculous. But there's two lanes to this case. These people were doing nefarious things on the side that have nothing to do with Mike. Zero. And there's no evidence that they were tied together in any way, shape or form. So anything that exonerated him, there's so much exculpatory evidence in this case that was suppressed at trial. I, 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 am, I am speechless at how far they will go to win. And it's all about the win. It's not about our safety. Now, by the way, Christopher Ray, the head of the FBI, said that these people were acting like an organized crime syndicate. So you're gonna tell me that the FBI knew this for four years or more, that they had our home address, that they may have been watching us, they had our bank account information, and nobody warns us. Nobody comes to my husband who's worked on many federal cases as an investigator. He's had 500, if not more cases as a PI with, again, very, very high profile cases with big attorneys. How can he be approved to work on a federal case as an investigator while they're investigating him for being a part of the China, this Chinese operation? So none of it makes any sense. I, I feel like there was the fact that the FBI would speak to Chinese criminals over five members of law enforcement, U.S. law enforcement in this case, is, is really shocking. I, trusting the word of Chinese criminals and, and, and working with them and letting them flee the country and, and, and letting them come back, that is the opposite of what our country is supposed to be doing, which is respecting, first of all, our safety, my family's safety. What about the other U.S. law enforcement? Who, why didn't you bring them in? Why didn't you bring them a part of this case to catch the bad guys instead of spying on us because that's what it is it's spying i mean you know you there's not one part of your life that hasn't been exposed to strangers nothing everything about you is now part of their whatever their their coffee talk at, at the at the office speaking on that martha your family has to pay a five hundred thousand dollar bail your bank accounts are, are shut off uh the press is camped outside your home talk talk more about that how did you handle all of this and and speak more to that this this raid uh that that takes place at your home as well they took him away and he wasn't handcuffed in our house he walked freely around the house the fbi agents were actually very friendly but they left and didn't tell me where they were taking him i didn't know what was going on they handed me the arrest warrant not him when, he, when they were leaving. So he had no idea what he was going into. And he spoke to the FBI freely because he, they never told him what he was charged with. So he's trying to put pieces together for two hours. He spoke freely. You know, I have no idea where he is. Um, and at trial, we weren't allowed to put in his interrogation video. We were, they only put in one minute or a couple minutes of it, where an hour and a half, he talks about being a civil case. He was hired on a civil matter. And we were prevented from putting that at trial, which was really upsetting. But the day of the arrest, the press, within an hour, Christopher Ray and Jonathan Demers are doing a press conference about my husband. And my children are home. I'm, I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. And I just told my son, pack a bag. I don't know where I'm, you're going. I don't know what's going on. My daughter was terrified. And she told me, she said, Mom, can you please tell them that when they were coming towards my bedroom, they scared me. I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, how dare they? They couldn't call my husband. They couldn't, they couldn't call him in and speak to him. They had to, listen, we know that FBI makes a choice when they raid. They make a choice of how to execute this arrest. They sat around a table and decided to do it when my children were home. I find that disgusting. When my husband has a stellar record, he's never had a parking ticket. And you do this to my children and you, and you traumatize them by choice. That to me is beyond beyond. And a three-week trial uh, takes place last summer. What's remarkable about this case isn't what was said during the, the trial, but it sounds like what, what was not said. I mean, nobody testified against your husband during the trial. Is that accurate? None. Not one person. Not one person. The person that they say he stalked 
or harassed couldn't identify him in court. The two other people that were you know, harassed or what they claim were couldn't identify my husband. They, not one agent who worked on this case testified. Nobody from the federal government testified on, that worked on this case. Could you imagine having a murder trial where the case agent doesn't take the stand and back up his, his accusations of a four year investigation? He was in the courtroom though. He sat there every day and he would walk past me and I wanted to just scream, like, how dare you? How dare you do this to my family? How dare you? But it's so scary is that I would sit there every day and think oh, they're, they're making it up. You know, I think it's important for people to understand when they're in court, they call it argument. Well, we can argue that this could have happened, but here's the problem. If you've seen the evidence that I've seen and you know that he's innocent and then you argue it with false information, that's not argument. That's made up. That's not true. When you've seen it, you know, it, uh, I couldn't believe the things we couldn't bring into court. We were not allowed to talk about his career, his good deeds. We were not allowed to talk about a civil lawsuit that was filed a few months after my husband did his surveillance on the subject for a $30 million or something like that lawsuit against him civilly. And we couldn't show his interrogation, which showed that he was used by these people. You know, it's, it, the fact that my husband provided information in an investigation, which is what he does, and that information ends up in a civil lawsuit a few months later at the address that they claim that he provided, it was public information. Everything he provided was public information. This is why it's so scary. People have to understand something is that if they want to get you, they're going to get you. Whether it's legal or not, they will just change the rules because it, nothing he did was outside the scope of what he was legally allowed to do as a private investigator and has done a million other times. So it's very, very disturbing. Your husband was convicted, uh, as we mentioned, three of four charges in June. Now he's, he's facing years in prison, as far as you know. When is he going to be sentenced at this point, Martha? Well, right now it's in July, mid-July. We have a sentencing date put on the calendar. I mean, how do you even punish him even more than we've already been punished. I mean, I'm sorry if people were felt that my husband did something to to put them in harm's way. He would never do that. He doesn't do he doesn't break the law. He knows what stalking is. He knows what harassment is. He knows the difference between what's legal and what's not. So they've taken his business. They've taken his reputation. He's considered a traitor in the in the world stage. I mean, our address was listed in a Chinese publication last year as him being part of the CCP operation. They put our family in danger for the rest of our lives. They put my children in a position where they have to go to school and face people that their father is some traitor, which they know he's not. My, my own oldest son just became a police officer. They know that their father's a hero. They know that he's innocent and we're showing them that you must fight back. Money comes and goes. Right? Money comes and goes, but you can't take away the truth, your integrity. This man has spent his entire life to service of others. Do you know many people out there have, are alive who have better lives because of him? I mean, he just stopped at a robbery of a 90 year old woman at our bank last year. He just stopped an assault in Grand Central Station last week of a woman who's being attacked. This is a man who's a hero and they have, they have destroyed him and it is enough is enough. We have, we have lost so much, but they have taken away what we've built before that. And I think that's important is that they just tried to destroy us. They tried to break us. They tried to, to, to take down a family. I have built this family. I worked hard. Our kids are wonderful kids. They're giving children and they, they traumatize them. So how much more do you wanna punish him You've taken everything from him, but he's still the same person. I mean, again, like I said, he stopped a robbery of a 90 year old woman at the bank. You know what happened? He, he was driving away and he noticed something wasn't right. And he turned back. He doesn't have his guns on him. He doesn't know what he's going to face. And the man was like assaulting this woman, this 90 year old woman in the car. He parked behind the car, made sure he, the woman couldn't get out. I mean, this is a man who he could, that guy could have had a gun, he could have stabbed him, but he doesn't, he just doesn't, he just does. He doesn't. That's who he is, instinctually. 
And you reached out after watching uh, the fall of Minneapolis. You said there are many similarities uh, in these cases, the exclusion of exculpatory evidence, the lies told by witnesses, prosecutors, even federal agents. Uh, why do you think it is so important for people to pay attention uh, to these cases? I think people don't understand how they get away with it. I think there's a, there's a, there's a missing link here. And I think we have to educate the viewer to understand that when you're faced with a, a crime, they're going to do everything they can to get you and win. And they have tools in their toolbox to do that, that we don't know about, right? As civilians, we don't know the law. We don't know the loopholes. We don't know the relationship with the judge and the prosecutors. We don't know that. So I feel like when I watched your documentary, which was fantastic, you just told the truth. You just showed the facts and you showed the evidence, you know, and we weren't allowed to show so much evidence at our trial that was exonerated him. And they man and they not only did they, they would take a picture on day one, they had a picture where they claimed it was taken in one month and it had been taken six months earlier. And we said, objection, that picture was taken six months prior. This is on day one, day one, they did that. And you, your heart, you feel like it's, it's, it's torn apart and you wanna scream. But what I will tell you is that you really have to make a decision. Your life is gonna be destroyed. You're gonna be taken down piece by piece. But I'm gonna tell you something. If my husband took a plea deal, you would never, he, he would never be the same person again. He would never perjure himself. He's the only person who told the truth in this case, the only one. So you have to hold on to that, but it's tough. I mean, even people we know in the federal government who are agents, they said, take the plea deal, take the plea deal, they'll destroy you. They have endless money. They will lie, they will cheat. They will do everything they have to do to get you. And we thought, no, 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 no. We gotta just keep going. And again, I'm glad we didn't take, I could never, my husband would never be the same if he lied and said he harassed anybody. He would, he would never do that, you know? I'd rather, I'd rather live with a man who has his integrity intact and be an example for my children. As parents, we're examples for our children. If we say, oh, just tell, just, just tell me you did something you didn't do. I mean, that goes the opposite of what we teach our children, right? We teach stand up to the bullies. Don't back down. Tell the truth, do the right thing, and everything will be fine. Can you imagine what my kids think about the government now? Imagine what they think about trusting the, 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 the system now? So my, my, to have my son become a police officer was such an honor. He said, I wanna be like my father. My father's a hero. You, you're an inspiration to me that you've done this. And the police department has embraced my son. It's just, it gives me hope that there's, I really believe there's more good people out there than not. And we need to hold, there's, hold some accountability because as you know, these prosecutors, they get immunity. These FBI agents get immunity how is that possible? Well, but either way, I have the analogy. Would you steal the candy bar, even though you know you could get away with it? No, if you're a good person, you don't. But if you think you can get away with it and no, there's no accountability and, you get, and people are all doing it around you, it becomes a cultural thing. But my husband worked in the NYPD. If, they did what, if he did what they did in this case, he would have lost his pension, he would have been fired. If you do anything outside the scope of what's true, if you've seen like you're you know, trying to be tricky, you're done. And not only that, you are seen as the worst possible person in the police department. My husband was a sergeant. He was in charge of 300 police officers. He held them all accountable. And his stats were incredible in the Bronx because he was, has integrity. And we need more of that. But these guys, they can't get away with this. I mean, in the criminal complaint against my husband, there's, there's so many lies in that criminal complaint I, I mean, seriously, it's, it, this is a sworn, they swear to this under oath, search warrants. What are they saying? You know, and I think you were talking about the grand jury, you know, they don't, we don't get to hear the grand jury. There's no, the defendant doesn't get to defend themselves in front of the grand jury. So if they're lying in, in documents we can see, what are they saying behind closed doors to a grand jury? How was he indicted? How were they able to get search warrants? Why are they trusting Chinese criminals over law enforcement in our country? There's a lot of unanswered questions, but I'm going to get to the bottom of it, believe me. And, and that's one of the questions. What do you think your, your husband's case is, is really all about? It's all about China. 
if we were in any other country, we would not have any, having this conversation. I mean, honestly, really? I mean, there, this was an optics case. All the bad guys were able to flee the country. My husband was the only one left. A couple of guys, you know, kind of who were doing some, you know, nonsense work in California, they were charged. But the woman that hired Mike was not charged. The gang member who provided the address 18 months later to the people was not charged. This was all about showing China that, you know, we are, we are not only are we doing something, we're arresting our own people. He was the only American. My husband was the only American, the only U.S. citizen in this case. I think it was for show. Big picture of my husband in the New York Post with the police commissioner. You know, pictures of me, the two of us together all over the Internet. Um, I feel like there, why take this case down the week before the election in 2020? There's, there's a lot of questions about the timing of it all. It's the middle of COVID. Why are they arrested? There's nobody here to get. This is not a big get. It was more for show. Um, and by the way, you know, our DOJ was traveling to, the CC, to China and negotiating the return of the guy that he, my husband was following often. So what's going on here? You know, this is, this, there's a lot of unanswered questions. And why are we protecting people who are not putting our country first? And, you know, what, what, what's really going on here? Uh, a lot of things. The Pipe Hitter Foundation, I know, is raising money and awareness uh, for your family. How can people help, Martha? Well, thank you so much. I mean, again, I would say, like, when these cases come up, you, you know, you have to have a million dollars in the bank, if you, at least, to fight them. Well, you know, you like you said, $500,000 bail and your, you know, your lawyer fees go crazy. And when the Pipe Hitter Foundation called us and said they wanted to support us, it was the best phone call we ever got because it was the first time someone publicly said, we believe you. And it's Eddie Gallagher, who Navy SEAL, Eddie Gallagher's foundation, and they support first responders, cops who are falsely accused. And they're a wonderful organization. Uh, so if you go to Pipe Hitter, with an H, pipehitterfoundation.org, and Mike, if you say people we, we support, go to his page, Michael McMahon, and um, help us. I mean, I just want people to know that the long game here, there's a bigger picture. And we are going to help a lot of people through this process. It's already started. We've already started to do kind of open a lot of doors in D.C. and a lot of communications going on about this case from Congress. Good ones. I was just there last week or a week and a half ago and was warmly welcomed by many congressmen and conversations are happening. And they're as horrified as, as I am that a hero who has sacrificed everything, his health, his his him his life for other people that they did this to him so please support us we really appreciate that and we've only just begun like i said we're gonna do it there's a lot more work coming really positive things yeah i think it's remarkable you're vowing to to help others through through all of this as well but martha Byrne, thank you so much for spending the time we're wishing your family uh the very be best and we'll be back in touch for sure thank you so much really appreciate it, it means a lot that'll do it for this episode of liz collin reports we'll see you next time mm -hmm.